Ladies and gentlemen, how is This is who were the last German holdouts in World War Two? Who, which were the, where were the, who were the? I don't know. Is it grammatically correct? I don't know. This was a channel side quest. Uh, obviously, this is a interesting video for me because I think Argentina is the one where people think that, right? Like, uh, you know, Nazis basically fled to Argentina, this and that. And that is true to that. Who was that like? Mengele? I think he was in there, right? He was there in Argentina. I'm pretty sure he was there. There's also his house, hut and everything. I don't know. But yeah, this is going to be an interesting video because I don't know much about this, right? I've, I've watched many World War II, World War One videos. It's on my channel, basically. Uh, but, you know, the, this kind of topic I never touched. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. Let's do it. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe. So, I know which type of videos to react to more. I love anything history related. You know, but th that's how I started this channel, history reaction, because history was never my subject. And I'm like, if I'm going to react something, why not start with that? So, yeah, let's do it. No matter how you look at it, the Second World War was a nasty affair. And it would have been a lot less painful for everyone if we could have just skipped it altogether and gone straight to the victory of global capitalism. I, if only Adam Smith could see us now. But there were some among the German camp who, well, they wouldn't take a hint, even after Herr Hitler performed what many would argue to be his only redeeming act, uh, killing Hitler. That happened on the 30th of April, which is also, coincidentally, International Jazz Day, leaving what was left of Nazi Germany in the hands of Admiral Dönitz. He would sign Germany's unconditional surrender. Just saying that Hitler killed himself, people are like, are you sure? Because there's way too many conspiracy theories, like he was somewhere, he lived his life somewhere, like in Argentina or somewhere, this, you know. Because people cannot comprehend that one guy who was this devastating, was this kind of an evil mastermind would just go out like that. They, they always have this like James Bond mentality, like he must have some kind of an evil plan, escape plan, he probably was somewhere. People cannot cope with like somebody who was way too over in his head, messed everything up and in the end killed himself, killed kill himself. That, that doesn't, people don't feel that. But when you really see how, uh, how his campaign failed and he was doomed to fail from the start, right how ambitious he was you can kind of see like how you know it would get to him on the 8th of may while simultaneously organizing the largest naval evacuation in history though that's a different topic now at the time of the surrender german control in europe looked more or less like this certainly a fair bit of land though ironically almost none in germany itself Today, we'll learn who I mean. these diehard stragglers were and when they surrendered. Oh, and you'll also get to hear about our dear friends over at Blinkist, but more about them at the end. Let's start from the west, on the Atlantic shores of France. As we all know, the Germans conquered France in June 1940, after a less than glamorous six-week campaign. They took control of France's Atlantic ports with the intent of using them as forward operating bases for their U-boat fleet. Now, these ports were respectable in their own right, but over the next three years, the Germans would build them up into impenetrable citadels, each mm. fielding a garrison of at least 20,000 men. Fast forwarding to 1944, when D-Day rolled around and the Allies swept through the French countryside, they had to figure out what to do with all these German strongholds in their rear, so to speak. Storming them would be a bloody affair, while bombing them would result in immense collateral damage to the nearby towns and their civilian populations. So the Allies decided to simply surround them and do nothing. Hmm. I mean, it wasn't yeah. all that bad of a plan. The Garrisons didn't why not really that? have the resources to stage a major breakout, and where would they be breaking out to, anyway? While the besiegers would just have yeah, I like how before the Caesar came, everybody just like, oh, this is the fortress. It's impenetrable. Nobody can do anything but, <laughs> And then they realize, oh, fuck me. We can't get out either. And we're going to starve here. To sit tight and keep an eye out, which was about as low risk of an assignment as one could get on the Western Front. The strategy worked. For once, Germany capitulated. The garrisons followed suit a few days later, happy to make it out with their lives. And at least some German soldiers in Lorient marked the occasion with a volleyball match. 
going a bit to the northeast, we'll find the Channel Islands, the only part of the British Empire proper to be. Okay, what's with the sport and humans? I never understood that. We regard sport is way too good. Even during the like uh, Christmas truce of World War One, everybody played football. Like, okay, <laughs> I just, I guess, what else is there, right? It's either play sport or I guess watch porn. What else is left? Be <laughs> occupied by the Germans. The small archipelago had no strategic importance, of course, and was evacuated once it was clear that the Battle of France was lost, despite intense protest from our dear friend Sir Winston Churchill, who scoffed at the idea of Britain surrendering its oldest crown possession without a fight. The Germans occupied the islands with no resistance in early July 1940, and mm. then went about their usual program of erecting forced labour camps and building extensive fortifications. Come no, the islands were ignored, much like the Atlantic naval bases. However, unlike the Atlantic naval bases, <laughs> fuck me, imagine that, right? Like your German forces there, concentration camps and everything. You see, you see just those D-Day boats going past you, the planes going past you. Like, what the hell? They're not even trying to come here and just goes to France. Like, yeah, just leave them. Who cares? <laughs> the Channel Islands had no major supply stockpiles. By the time Germany capitulated, both the remaining civilians and the occupiers were on the brink of starvation, and so they surrendered the very next day. Further east, we have the infamous pocket of Dunkirk. In a great mm. twist of irony, the site where the Nazis almost pushed the British expeditionary force into the sea would become the place of their own intense struggle. Under the iron command of Vice Admiral Friedrich Frisius, the 10,000-man garrison survived several assaults by the Allies. He famously staged the last German offensive operation in France on the dawn of April the 5th, which pushed the Allies an impressive 15 kilometers before digging in until the end of the war. He too surrendered a day after Germany capitulated, and then spent two years in a POW camp before ultimately being released and spending the rest of his days back home in Saxony. In the nearby Netherlands, we have two islands holding through the capitulation. The island of Texel was garrisoned by... Alright, you know, I often wonder about this, about whenever some leader or some group of people have this kind of an idea and everybody follows it and do certain things and when the time comes, only the leaders that get punished and everybody just like, we were just following orders like... Even in today's conflict, right? I mean, uh, you know, you know how they say like, uh, if you see some crime and don't report it, you are complicit. Like you are also the problem, right? That kind of thing, right? Uh, I don't know. There's a saying in you know in my native language. I don't know how to, uh, how to say it in English, basically. But basically that. So you know, even the current events that's happening in the world right now. Aren't the people themselves also complicit because they're not revolting against what's happening, right? I mean, you can't just sit, oh, oh, I have no power, it's my government, it's my military, what can I do about it and just go about your day when people are dying? Like, it's your government, right? It's your people's military, military made by your people, now they're conscripting them as well, your government. If you don't do anything about it, if you don't revolt and just try to stop it, right? Like, you know, government has become too tyrannical, stop it or something like that. Then you agree with what's happening. So when in the end, uh, you know, hammer comes down, aren't you, aren't you the one also responsible for that and should be, you know, part of the punishment, not just leader, right? I don't know. I think about this a lot. But then again, how can you punish so many people, right? So I don't know. Same thing with this, uh, you know, around this time, Nazi, like lots of people were actually, you know, like Nuremberg trials, right? Lots of people were, you know, trial like this, you did this, right? Type of thing. And some people were just like, you know, let go, lived his their whole life. Like even the high key people, they were giving orders. Like I was just following orders is not enough, right? By a battalion of Georgians from the country, not the state who had been captured on the Eastern Front and had chosen to switch sides. On the 5th of April, they suddenly decided that the Nazis were no longer cool and instigated a bloody rebellion, which wasn't resolved until the Allies arrived on the 20th of May. Meanwhile, on another Dutch island, 
the Germans just flat out refused to surrender all the way until the 11th of June, making that unremarkable strip of land the last part of Europe to be liberated from Axis occupation. Damn. To the north in Norway, we'll find nearly 400,000 German soldiers. Originally stationed to cover Germany's northern flank, by May 1945, they were surely counting their blessings that they weren't fighting on the Eastern Front. Many soldiers had an almost peacetime attitude, taking Sundays off, which made some sense. After all, Norway at the time had a population of barely 3 million, so the Germans had effectively total control over it. There was some fear that the... Yeah, I think that Norway thing is mostly because of Soviet Union. After basically if Germany wins in many places, uh, they, you know, they're... They, they want to cross Soviet Union their mentality. That was one of the key points, right? Because as I've seen in real life lore videos, how Norway can be real point for the, you know, sea travel, because that's a choke point, right? So that could really, you know, constrict Russians there. So I guess that was one of the more reasons. I remember watching Grand Tour episode, one of the latest one, where they just mistakenly, I think it was in Norway, mistakenly just went in some place. And they're like, oh, you're, you're Norway are military? No, no, they are not Norway military. This is so, so fucking awesome, seeing that underground base. Nazis would try to bunker down in Norway. But luckily, they laid down their arms and fully surrendered on the 11th of May. On the nearby Danish island of Bornholm, the 10,000-strong German garrison initially refused to surrender to the Soviets and endured a fierce bombing campaign before giving up on the 9th of May. Like, the Soviets were also lost, having man. a field fighting? day in Latvia, where 200,000 German and Latvians were encircled even after Admiral Dönitz's miracle evacuations. They surrendered on the 10th of May and received the classic Soviet treatment of mass deportations to forced labor camps in wonderful Damn. Siberia. On the other side of Europe, the Germans retained parts of Crete and Rhodes for a few more days, as well as scattered pockets in Yugoslavia, where things get a bit too graphic for our show. Parts of Austria and Czechia were also yet to be captured by the advancing Soviets. And of course, we have Berlin itself, where fighting continued until the 9th of May. Beyond these territories were numerous German soldiers scattered across the world. The last active U-boat, for example, fled to Argentina, providing absolutely no fuel for conspiracy theories, and only surrendered on the 17th of I mean, it's not conspiracy, wasn't it's like uh, Mengele was there in Argentina, wasn't that the thing? I'm pretty sure, again, with the Top Gear episode, not going to this, no, wait, yeah, Top Gear Patagonia episode, I remember, uh, you know, them telling about that. I don't know how accurate they but wasn't Mengele there, Argentina, in his last days? ...of August. The very last German troops to give up their arms were stranded on the frigid Norwegian island of Svalbard where they were tasked with establishing a secret weather station. They only got the chance to surrender on the 6th of September, when they were rescued by a crew of Norwegian seal hunters. Of course, this is just one of the thousands of stories you can find neatly retold by our good friends over at Blinkist. Thanks to the Blinkist app, you can subsume vast quantities of knowledge in delicious bite-sized 15-minute yeah, people, go to the original video page link and, you know, help this channel side quest by going to blinkcase.com for such side quest. Yeah, seriously, this, I mean, Germans had so many contingency plans. That's where the conspiracy comes from. Like, what if there's already, if there's already some kind of a, uh, you know, German base somewhere. And knowing how many, like, the Sentinel Island, lots of islands that is untouched by outside world. What if there is some island or some place? But Germans are still holding out, the Nazis are still holding out and still untouched by outside world and they're still plotting the same thing, right? I mean, it's not that far-fetched a thing. I mean, kind of is, but still. It feels uh, ridiculous when you say it, but come on. I mean, all, if all the things that possible, that wouldn't be like that far-fetched. <laughs> yeah. Nazis were ridiculous. Uh, the, the way they planned shit for future and everything, how extreme they were, like, holy shit. And that's what happens when war isn't fought for some gain, but ideology. War for ideology is scariest shit of all time. That's what we see in World War II. Because they weren't trying to just like in World War I, where they're just trying to be dominant country. No, 
they have certain ideology that they are trying to that makes you too extreme right that gives you certain drive that is a scary but yeah uh, Orville, that was who were the last German holdouts in World War II by channel SideQuest. If you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, comment down if you want to react to another, another history video. Uh, past three, four months, I haven't been that active in channel, but now I think I'm starting to get back to normal, where I post multiple videos a day. So definitely comment down if you want me to react to a certain video or certain series I didn't finish. Uh, if you want me to finish, I don't remember which series I unfinished, but okay. Alright, I'll see you next time.